Welcome, everybody, and thanks for coming to the next edition, the latest edition of the UCL Lunchtime Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Jason Dittmer from the Department of Geography, and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, who is Professor Arun Hingarani from the UCL Institute for Cardiovascular Science. Uh, and he's here today to talk to you about genomics and healthcare. And with that, I will abandon the floor to him. Please do make your way in and, and take your seats. So it's a great privilege to be able to come and uh, deliver the lunch hour lecture in what is Heart Awareness Month, which is, I think, one of the reasons I'm here. Um, and it's, um, it, it's, it's also um, good because much of the research that I'm going to speak about is funded by the British Heart Foundation. So I thought I'd start by just giving you a few key facts and figures about the burden and cost of cardiovascular disease. I'm going to be talking mainly about the sorts of cardiovascular disease that arises from atherosclerosis, furring up of the arteries, although I'll touch on other things as well. I'll touch on some of the risk factors for heart disease, such as blood pressure, and I'll also touch on some of the arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythms that contribute to the burden of heart disease. Now, it turns out that in high-income countries, and in Europe particularly, the mortality rate from cardiovascular disease is actually falling. But more people are surviving with cardiovascular disease, and so the burden of ill health arising from cardiovascular disease is, is very, very substantial. So that at any one time, there's about a million and a half people in the UK who have previously suffered a myocardial infarction, about 1.2 million a stroke, and 2.7 million people are living with other types of cardiovascular disease as well. And the cost of treating these patients is really very, very substantial and is increasing. You'll be aware that globally there's a burden of type 2 diabetes, and that's one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So there's a projected uh, resurgence of, of cardiovascular disease uh, over the next decade or two. Another important point is that in low- and middle-income countries, where in the past infectious diseases have been the major healthcare burden, gradually as those societies are adopting a more uh, uh, affluent uh, uh, lifestyle, coronary heart disease is increasing. Now, the challenges of healthcare in cardiovascular disease are similar to any disease area. They are improved diagnosis or prediction of disease, prediction of treatment response, so that we can target treatments to those who are most likely to benefit and least likely to be harmed, but also the development of new treatments that add value to those that we have already. And one thing to bear in mind is that in cardiovascular disease, there are already some very, very successful therapies. Blood pressure lowering treatments, treatments to lower cholesterol, clot busting treatments to open up arteries that are occluded, and so on. Now, what about genomics? How's this going to help? What I'm going to touch on in the remainder of the lecture are two types of uh, genetic contributions to cardiovascular disease that might be considered to be at the opposite ends of the spectrum. So on the left, there are some types of cardiovascular disease that are wholly the result of a genetic mutation. These are so-called monogenic disorders, and they have a Mendelian pattern of inheritance, a predictable pattern of inheritance in families. In these disorders, a mutation is both necessary and sufficient to produce the disease. By contrast, the common forms of cardiovascular disease, bearing in mind that about one in two of us who are male and one in three of us who are female will suffer a cardiovascular event during our lives, are thought to be due to common sequence differences. Those sequence differences are not thought to be majorly disruptive to the function or expression of proteins and may be compatible with health, but on average they increase the risk of developing an event and that might be enhanced by the influence of other genes and adverse environmental factors. So I'm going to start with the monogenic cardiovascular disorders, of which there are a number. They include disorders of heart muscle, disorders of heart rhythm, certain monogenic forms of high blood pressure, monogenic forms of diabetes, remember a strong risk factor for heart disease, and monogenic forms of elevated lipid. So here's an example. This is a disease that's been known about for a very, very long time. 
It runs in families in an autosomal dominant pattern for the most part, and it's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It results in a thickening of the left ventricle, the major pumping chamber of the heart. And as a consequence, there's a disruption in the electrical conduction within that chamber. And these patients can experience sudden death from a rhythm abnormality. Here's one of the first pedigrees with this disorder that was described. And you can see that both men and women are affected. It's visible in all generations. And there's about a one in two risk of developing the disease if one of your parents has it. It has an autosomal dominant pattern. Now, we will talk in a little while about the sequencing of the human genome. These studies were conducted well before the genome was sequenced. So I think in genomics, we're beginning to think about before the genome was sequenced and after the genome sequenced as a, as a pivotal point. But what was done to identify the causative genes and the causative mutations in these families was a pedigree analysis where markers through the genome were followed through multiple generations of pedigrees affected by the disease to see which portions of the genome were always found in those with the disease, but not those without. And what those markers do is that they point to a location in the genome where the disease gene must lie. In this case, it was chromosome 14. And it was known at the time that the localization was attributed to this region that nearby was a gene called the beta-myosin heavy chain. And this is a component of the contractile apparatus of the heart muscle, so a very good candidate. And when the gene was sequenced, it was found that there was a mutation in individuals who, who uh, were affected by the disease, but never in those who were not. So the cause of the, of the disease was found. Now, one of the health care consequences of this might be that one could develop a, a diagnostic test for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, that's possible to some degree, but there are some challenges. And the challenges arise because there are other families with the same disorder, a clinically similar disorder, that have mutations in different genes. And even if another family has a mutation in the same gene, it may not be the same mutation. So developing a genetic test that is all-encompassing is rather difficult, and that still remains a challenge, although new technologies are emerging where it's possible to sequence the whole of the genome in individuals at low cost. And what I say now may not apply in five or 10 years' time. There may be a genetic test that's widely applicable. I'm going to give you another example of a monogenic disorder, and this time it's a disorder that increases the risk of cardiovascular disease because it affects blood pressure. So again, you'll see a familiar pedigree pattern of individuals affected and unaffected, and in these individuals, the blood pressure is high from a very early age, and there's a biochemical abnormality that seems to suggest there's a problem with salt handling in the kidney. In fact, when one of these patients happened to have a renal transplant for another condition, the blood pressure was cured. So it seemed very likely that the kidney was responsible. And when a linkage analysis was done, it was found that individuals who were affected by the disease had a mutation in a sodium channel, a channel in the nephron that is involved in salt handling. And actually, this was a channel that was always turned on. It was always reabsorbing sodium and couldn't be stopped. And when you reabsorb sodium, you retain, you retain water with it, volume increases, and your blood pressure goes up. Now, the interesting thing about this example is that we already had a drug, a diuretic drug, called amylaride. Now, amylaride binds this channel. And so it provided, if you like, an exquisitely precise medicine for these people. So if these people are found and are found to have this condition, they can be treated very specifically with this drug and the blood pressure is, is restored to normal and the biochemical abnormality uh, converts back. So this opens up the idea that we might have targeted treatments according to mutations. Now that's an aspiration. There are a few other examples in different disease areas, but there's much, much more to be done to try and exploit these sorts of findings. I'm going to turn now to something much tougher. And those are the sorts of disorders that affect most of us, the so-called polygenic disorders that we believe are due to modest sequence differences that raise the risk of cardiovascular and other diseases. Now, it was these disorders 
that required the sequencing of the genome for the genetic uh, causative variants to be found. So as you may know, the, the genome was sequenced in approximately 2003 with a number of goals. And questions are now being asked about how we might be able to use this information to improve health care. Now, the first thing to bear in mind is it was only two or three or four genomes that were sequenced. In other words, the first goal was to identify a consensus sequence of the human genome and other organisms. And the, one of the early potential health care benefits of doing that was that in sequencing the whole genome, one finds automatically all human proteins. And proteins are the target of 98% of the drugs that are used in clinical practice. So if you know all the proteins, you should know all the drug targets. In effect, we should have information on what's called the druggable genome. So it turns out there may be about 4,000 or 5,000 proteins out of the 25,000 in all that might be readily targetable by drugs. So that's, a, that's an important finding, but there remains a key issue, and that is that we have to find the right target for the right disease. Otherwise, we're not much further, and I'll come back to that towards the end. Now, in order to understand which of these variants influence our susceptibility to disease, what needed to be done next was to find how human beings differ from one another in their sequence. And so there were great efforts in order to identify differences between individuals that were undertaken by groups around the world that followed the sequencing of the genome. This included the work of um, the SNP consortium, such that there was a map created of all common single nucleotide polymorphisms in the genome. These single nu nucleotide polymorphisms refer to single base differences between one person and another. And they seem to uh, occur at particular points in the genome with particularly high frequency. They're not the only type of variation that we see. Sometimes we see bases inserted in some individual genomes, but not others. And sometimes there are repetitive sequences. In fact, in some individuals, in all individuals, we carry differences in the number of large sec sections of the genome that we have or don't have, or which are duplicated. But most of the advances that have been made in understanding the causes of ge the genetic contribution to common diseases have come from studies of these single nucleotide polymorphisms. Now, I talked to you previously about pedigrees as being the unit of interest when trying to identify uh, causative mutations in monogenic disorders. But in these diseases, a different design was needed, and that was to study people with disease and people without. In fact, unrelated individuals, which at first sounds counterintuitive for genetics. What was done was technology was developed to type SNPs across the genome of many individuals at low cost. Now, there are several million SNPs across the genome, and it would have been very expensive to type all of them. But many of them are inherited together. So getting information on one automatically provides information on the others, even if they're not typed. So cost-efficient SNP arrays were produced, and they were applied on a large scale in patients with disease and patients without. And the idea here was to try and identify were there points in the genome where individuals with the disease tended to carry a particular variant and those without didn't. So the typical analysis that's done is shown here. These are the chromosomes uh, on the x-axis, and this is the p-value, a test of statistical association between carriage of a variant and disease outcome. And what you can see here is that there's a, a sort of a stack of points on chromosome 9. These represent the values for a statistical test of association with disease for SNPs in this region. Now, those of you familiar with biomedicine will often be familiar with a p-value threshold, a threshold for statistical significance of 0.05. Here, the test of statistical significance is a p-value of 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And the reason that it has to be so stringent is because we're doing so many tests, 500,000 tests or more across the genome. So the risk of a false positive association is high. So correction needs to be applied for these multiple tests. So this was a variant found, or set of variants on chromosome 9, that increased the risk of coronary heart disease. So this is a map of the human genome uh, in 2011. 
Each point, each flag, indicates a point in the genome where we know there are variants that influence the risk of a common disease or a biomarker or risk factor for a disease. And you can see it's pretty dense now. If you had looked back in 2005, it would have been virtually empty. So it gives you an impression of the scale of activity that's been going on in the last five to seven years. And in fact, if I were to show you the 2013 one, it would be even more densely packed than this. So we're beginning to understand how these variants are working. Along the x-axis here are a list of some variants that influence blood pressure. What you can see here is that the effect on blood pressure, up or down, is tiny. It's about half to one millimeter of mercury, almost below the level that you can actually measure in clinical practice. Remember, an average blood pressure is 120 over 80 or so. So each of these SNPs has a really, really, really tiny effect. In order to detect that effect, needed really large studies. Literally hundreds of thousands of individuals were genotyped to identify these variants. The other thing we found, and again the example comes from blood pressure, is that these risk alleles are not all clustered in one place in the genome. They're distributed across many, many, many different chromosomes. And that has an important consequence. And the consequence is that because chromosomes are inherited independently, according to Mendel's laws, the chance of inheriting a large number of risk alleles is quite small. Similarly, the chance of inheriting a small number of risk alleles is also small. Most of us, as always, stick in the middle, and we have an intermediate number, an average number of risk alleles for any disorder. Of course, the more alleles you have, the higher the effect. So these individuals with many risk alleles for blood pressure have a much higher blood pressure than those um, with, with a lower number of risk alleles. Now, we've talked on the one hand about rare variants with a very strong effect causing Mendelian disorders, and on the other about common variants that cause common forms of disease. But is there a group in the middle? Well, it turns out that there is. And these variants of intermediate frequency, which are of intermediate effect, have been found by sequencing. And in fact, this is an example of individuals being sequenced from the top and the tail of the blood pressure distribution, the hypothesis being that they should carry more or less of these variants, sequencing done in a number of candidate genes, and uh, showing that carriage of one or more of these variants has a much larger effect on blood pressure than those small effect alleles. So we're beginning to define the architecture, the genetic architecture of disease. On the one hand, very rare variants with very large effects. On the other, very common variants with very modest effects. And now we're beginning to uncover those intermediate effect variants. Now, what about healthcare? What about applying this knowledge to improve health? Well, we can think of it in two broad flavors. Benefits for an individual, and benefits for the population. Let's start with the individual. Could we use these variants to predict the risk of future disease in an individual? Here the example is diabetes. This is the number of variants influencing the risk of type 2 diabetes carried by individuals in the Whitehall 2 population, one of UCL's cohort studies. What you can see here is that the frequency distribution of risk alleles in people who develop diabetes and those who don't is overlapping. It shifted slightly to the right among those who are affected by the disease, as you would expect. But you can see how it would be difficult to set a threshold to find who would or wouldn't get the disease. Because of these effects are very, very small and randomly assort, it's quite difficult to use them for risk prediction. So perhaps a little disappointing. What about personalized medicine, targeting treatments to those who are most likely to benefit? In fact, this is, this is an area that's lagged behind the discovery of genes for common diseases. Here's a, a, a plot of the accumulation of those genome-wide association studies that I told you about. And here at the bottom in the white are genome-wide association studies of drug response, lagging behind and of slightly lower quality. So more work to be done in that area. What about population rather than individual benefits? And this is where I'll close. People are now beginning to apply the genomic data to a really big and thorny issue, and that is drug development. 
So I'm going to talk to you first about what problems there are in developing new drugs for heart disease and other disease areas. I'm going to illustrate how genomics can help, and I'm going to give you some examples. Here are the top five drugs in the world by sales in 2009. And you'll see number one is atorvastatin, a drug that lowers cholesterol. Number two is clopidogrel, a drug that thins the blood that's used in the treatment of a variety of heart diseases. These are very lucrative drugs, or were for their manufacturers, until their patent expired. And it's now expired for both of those drugs, so those revenue streams have halted. So those are the successes. But there's a litany of failures. These are just some of the drugs that have failed in cardiovascular disease since about 2004 or so. They targeted different proteins, but most of them failed very late in the drug development process, as I'll show you. And no company was immune. There were some small companies, and there were some big companies involved here in these failures. But when these drugs failed, there were big financial consequences. Here's an example of that. So there was a drug called Varesplodib that failed in what's called a phase three trial, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. It's quite a small company that was manufacturing this drug. And on the 8th of March, this was their stock price in 2012. On the 9th of March, the trial of this drug was stopped for futility reasons. It wasn't going to work. And this is what happened to the stock price since. Now, for a small company, this has a dramatic consequence and a very human cost as well. So these are, this is how drugs are developed. It's a sort of linear pipeline. On the left-hand side is preclinical development in cells, tissues, and animal models. On the right-hand side, clinical studies. And the drug has to first pass through this process, get to this point before a big decision is made. Do we take it into man or not? And as this goes on, the costs increase. So if you fail here, you haven't spent very much. If you fail right at the end in a randomized control phase three trial in human beings, you will have spent between four and $11 billion, and it will have taken you about 12 to 15 years. So the consequences of failure late are very, very high. So when do drugs fail? Well, in cardiovascular disease and in other disease areas, all too often they fail late. But the reason for failure is even more surprising. They fail because they don't work. It seems odd that you should have taken a drug so far along the development pipeline only to find at the end that it didn't work. What was going on before? It turns out that all the preclinical experiments that one does can be misleading on the validity of a drug target uh, as being responsible or influential in the disease. Now, it turns out that the randomized controlled trial, the experiment at the end, is the most valuable. Why? Because it's done in human beings, not in model organisms. It's done on a very, very large scale. And actually, it's not a, simply a test of the efficacy and safety of a molecule. It's a test of whether the target of that molecule is really responsible for the disease or not. And it's an experiment. There are two groups, those who receive the drug and those who don't, just like in an, in an experiment in the lab. But in the lab, you would actively control all other factors to make them the same between the two groups. Now, it wouldn't be ethical to do that in free-living human populations, so we do something else. We randomize the allocation of the drug or the placebo. What that means is that on average, provided a large enough number of people are randomized, the two groups will be equal in all other respects, other than receipt or not of the active compound. Now, the problem is, to do these trials, you have to develop the drug. Take it through the drug development pipeline, spend your $4 billion, take 12 years or so. So it's a catch-22. What we'd really like to have is randomized evidence in humans on a large scale, but without having to design a drug. Sounds too good to be true? This is where genetics could help. Allocation of alleles in your genome from parent to offspring, is a randomized allocation at conception. Chromosomes are sought independently, according to Mendel's laws. So if you have an allelic variant in a gene that encodes a protein that could be a target for a drug, then carriage of that allele, if it affected the function, the level, or structure of that protein, should alter the risk of disease, and it should profile the effect of targeting the same protein pharmacologically. Well, is that true? You'll be familiar with drugs that lower cholesterol. 
for statin drugs. This is a plot of the different statin drugs that are available at different doses. So there are different drugs, some are more potent than others, and obviously the higher the dose you have, the bigger the effect. And the effect here is the reduction in LDL cholesterol. Now, if you look down here, there's a little red box. That's the effect of a SNP on LDL cholesterol. And it turns out to be a SNP in a gene that encodes the target for statins, the same protein. In fact, if you look at the effect of this single nucleotide polymorphism on LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, and apolipoprotein B, some other blood lipids, all of them are lowered by carriage of the SNP. And if you look at the clinical trial data of statin drugs, those same factors are lowered by statin treatment. So if you'd never designed the drug, but just looked at the genetic information, the genetic information would have told you what the drug was going to do. And actually, some groups have shown that this variant also reduces the risk of heart disease, and that's why we give statins to people. So can we now apply that information prospectively? HDL cholesterol is a form of good cholesterol. The, bigger, the higher the level of cholesterol, the lower your risk of heart disease. And the lower risk of cholesterol, the higher the risk of heart disease. So this is an attractive target for new drugs. But we don't know if that's a causal association. When a drug was designed that blocks a protein that influences HDL cholesterol with a really big effect, it increased the level of HDL cholesterol, which is thought to be beneficial. When it was tested in a clinical trial, there was a big surprise. It didn't lower the risk of heart disease, it increased it. And it was suspected that that might have been due to an effect of the drug that hadn't been noticed during earlier development. And that was that the drug raises blood pressure. It raises blood pressure. Not a good thing. Now, there was an uncertainty then. Does blockade of this protein, it's called CETP, always lead to an elevation of blood pressure? Is that an effect of the blockade of the protein? Or is it simply an idiosyncratic effect of the molecule, the new molecule that was developed? That's an important distinction. Why? Because there were two or three other drugs that targeted the same protein in development. Should we proceed with their development or halt? Now, genetic information can tell us about the on-target effect of drugs. And in fact, when you look at a variant in this gene, it has the same effect on the protein, and it has the same effect on lipids as the drug. So the two points I show you in all these slides are the effect on, uh, of, on, the, on the variant in a genetic study in populations and the drug in trials. But, so this is the concordance of, the, of those effects. But we showed that the drug, uh, the gene, I beg your pardon, doesn't affect blood pressure, indicating that the effect of the drug on blood pressure was not due to the effect on CTP. And in fact, since then, it's been shown that the other drugs that are now in development have the, 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 uh, the, the intended effect on cholesterol, but don't affect blood pressure. So applying genetic information to answer questions in drug development. A final example. There's a connection between inflammation and heart disease, and one of the potential mediators is an inflammatory cytokine that circulates in the blood called interleukin-6. Just like a higher cholesterol is associated with a higher risk of heart disease, so is a higher level of interleukin-6. But we're unsure if that association is causal or not. Interleukin-6 acts on a receptor, and the activation of receptor has inflammation effects. Now, there's a drug that blocks the receptor. It's a monoclonal antibody. But it's not used for heart disease. It's used for rheumatoid arthritis. It's in clinical use. It's approved by NICE. If interleukin-6 was involved in heart disease, and if the receptor was involved in heart disease, we would have a drug already for a different disease that could be repurposed for a new indication. So can we test that? Well, we identified a SNP in the gene that encodes the receptor for the drug and asked the question, does it have an effect that would reduce heart disease risk? So we did a study that involved many uh, groups collaborating across the world with information on over 133,000 individuals and their genotype. And what we did was we looked at the effect of the genetic variant, and you can carry one or two copies of the variant, on interleukin-6, C-reactive protein, another inflammation marker, and fibrinogen. And the SNP had an effect. And in fact, the effect of the SNP on these markers, 
recapitulated the effect of the drug on the same markers in clinical trials. Now, they weren't clinical trials in heart disease. They were clinical trials in rheumatoid arthritis, because that's where the drug's used. But because this SNP is recapitulating the effect of the drug on these variables, we can now ask, what's the effect of the SNP on heart disease? And when we looked at that, we found that the SNP reduced the risk of heart disease. So a SNP in a gene that, in the receptor for the drug that recapitulates the effect of blocking the receptor reduces heart disease risk. So it suggests there may be a possibility that blockade of this receptor could be a new drug development opportunity for coronary disease prevention. Now, when you do studies of this type with very large implications, it's reassuring if there's replication from an independent source. And in fact, when we published this paper, there was a, a, another paper by a, another group showing exactly the same findings, and both papers were published together. We were also able to show that blockade of the receptor is also not likely to increase the risk of cancer, although because this pathway is involved in protection from infection, we need to be wary that that might be an adverse effect. Now, if we think about these sorts of genetic studies, so-called Mendelian randomization trials, um, in this way, perhaps we could exploit all the genetic information in the genome on genome-wide association studies for drug development. And in fact, if you look through this database of the genome-wide association studies, you not infrequently find that the genes that increase the risk of disease are already targeted by drugs for the treatment of the same condition. But there are many other um, disease genes that have yet to be exploited for uh, drug targeting. So we're beginning to do that by trying to map information from genetic association studies onto a database of, of known drugs and drugged proteins in collaboration with the European Bioinformatics Institute. So in conclusion, there have been great strides in the identification of genes underlying a number of cardiovascular disorders. The genetic architecture is likely to be a continuum from common alleles of small effect to rare alleles of large effect. Predicting the risk of disease and drug response based on common weak effect alleles remains challenging. But using genetic association studies as if they were randomized trials could provide a new source of evidence to transform the efficiency of drug development. I'd like to conclude by thanking a huge number of co-investigators, colleagues, and collaborators from UCL and internationally uh, for all their contributions, and in particular, the very large cohort studies that UCL and uh, partner institutions hosts, which have been curated over the years with much information on disease risk and biomarkers and now genotype, which are applied in, in, in the sorts of studies uh, that I described. And thank you for your attention. Okay, we have about eight minutes for questions. Uh, we do ask that uh, you put your hands up if you have a question. Uh, before you ask your question, uh, you need to wait for one of the stewards here to bring down the microphone so that we can all hear you and so that the many millions watching online uh, can, can likewise hear you. We have first question there, up top. Um, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, you didn't mention anything about environmental factors. Um, to be anecdotal, my heart's good, my blood pressure's good, the oxygen intake's good, but my cholesterol's high. And I keep being told, take cholesterol, but I've heard that there are some really gross effects by uh, taking uh, statins, that some really bad effects. For instance, um, the maths teacher at Highgate school commit suicide under a train a couple of years ago through it and I just feel safer not to take statins um, and just sort of be vegetarian and walk a lot and swim and all that sort of thing. What do you say about environmental factors? So clearly environmental factors influence the risk of, of disease, that's absolutely clear. Um, however, statins have been proven to be very, very effective in reducing cardiovascular risk on average in, in clinical trials. Um, there was a concern many decades ago with other drugs that lowering cholesterol increased the risk of, of suicide. That's been shown to be absolutely false. And so statins are proven to be very, very effective, very, very safe. Of course, the decision to take any drug uh, 
is an individual one, and doctors are there to advise on the risks and benefits of treatment, but also the risks of, of not taking treatment. But in the end, it's an individual decision. Can you, can you wait one second for the microphone, please? Can you sort of say some of the environmental factors that help? I mean, I would think not eating meat and eating greens and exercising. Could you just touch on them for a minute? Because I did sort of put that in my question, if you okay, please. Okay, yeah. So the question was about what are the uh, dietary and lifestyle factors that might help reduce cardiovascular risk? So the evidence points to the fact that a diet low in saturated fat is helpful, a diet rich in fresh fruits and vegetables is helpful, reducing salt intake from what's average uh, in the general population is helpful in reducing blood pressure, exercise is helpful, um, and um, so those are some of the factors that, that most of us can, can apply in our, in our lives to reduce our, our cardiovascular risk. Other questions? Despite my mention of many millions, please don't feel shy. <laughs> yes, we have one here. That's been fantastic. Please, one second. It's been fantastic in cardiovascular things because of your groups that have been followed. What would you say the disorders are of which there's equally good long-term cohort data on for which these techniques might be applicable? It's a very good question. The question was, can the techniques be applied in other disease areas? You're right to point out that the benefit we have in cardiovascular disease is that we have cohorts that have been followed for a long, long period of time in which there's not simply information on the disease endpoint, but also on biomarkers and risk factors of uh, relevant to future disease. And in cardiovascular disease, there are many of those. The reason is that atherosclerosis is, occurs in the lining of blood vessels, and you can sample the blood, which is the environment immediately adjacent to that. So there are challenges in other disease areas, for example, in neurological disease. The challenges are not that the genetic variants haven't been found, they have, but it's that there aren't very good uh, biomarkers that can be measured on a large scale. So that is a challenge. It's something that we need to, to think about in other disease areas to fully exploit this sort of technique. But in principle, uh, there's no area where this couldn't be applied. I might use Chair's prerogative to ask my own question. Uh, earlier you mentioned the sort of individual uses for this kind of technique, and then you, you sort of largely went on to the, to the group ones. Uh, or population level ones. I mean, are any of those individual solutions that you outlined uh, sort of cost effective or anything? I mean, I, it seemed like kind of a, a large amount of apparatus to be brought to bear on one person. Yeah. So, of course, there are a number of genetic uh, uh, tests that are approved for clinical use. Uh, and, and they're commissioned in the UK and, and, and they're applied. And of course, they're very, very helpful. Um, but there are challenges, and the challenges depend on the disease area and the type of mutation. Where most uh, of the cases of disease can be accounted for by variation in a single gene, and even better, by a single mutation, then of course a test becomes easier. It's where there's a lot of heterogeneity in a particular disorder. So where those tests are cost-effective, they are applied. And of course, cost-effectiveness is changing because the cost of genotyping and now of sequencing is diminishing very, very rapidly. So what might be deemed cost ineffective now may not be the case in the, in, in the very near future. So it's a very rapidly moving field. The expectation is clearly that there will be more predictive uses of genetic testing, both for disease risk, diagnosis, and, and actually for drug response as well. Um, there are some challenges to overcome, but I'm sure in many areas they will be. I think our last question right in the middle Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I was just wondering, is there any scope for personalized medicine with this kind of uh, research? And would that be beneficial, better than like what's available now? So the question is, uh, are there benefits? Are, is this knowledge likely to be applicable to personalized medicine? Of course, that's one of the major aims. That's one of the major aims. What I've tried to illustrate to you is that from a predictive perspective, there are still quite a number of challenges. 
I think some of those challenges will be solved in the future. Precisely how widely personalized medicine could be applied remains to be seen. There are already some examples in, in clinical practice, in the cancer field, and in, and in some other fields. But they're, 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 quite, they're quite small at the moment. But it's a growing area. It's an area called pharmacogenetics, as you, as, as you may know. In fact, UCL has an MSc in pharmacogenetics, and that is indicative of the interest in the area and, 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 and the interest in communicating knowledge about this area. So I, I think it's all to, be, all to be done, and watch this space. Uh, we may have a list of examples in five years' time. Okay, on that, on that bright speculative note, let's uh, join me, please, if you will, in thanking <laughs> Professor. Thank you.